What was it like for you to transfer in life from Nick Hardwick, Charger, highly recognizable, to civilian Nick Hardwick? Yeah. Yeah. What was that? I mean, I would imagine emotionally this had to be challenging. So I think the weight loss really helped with that. It helped me shed that shell, that armor that I had on. I kind of describe it like the Orkin man. You know, he's got that suit of armor on mm -hmm. and he goes in and he's killing all the bugs. But I felt like that I had a huge body of armor on where I could walk into any room and be like, who wants this? <laughs> well, I lost that. I, I took off my coat of armor and I just became me. And it was refreshing. And I didn't have to feel like, I, I lost a lot of ego along with that size and strength and power. And I got super depressed right away, just trying to figure out what's next. It got described to me once as football was a corridor, a decision-making corridor. And while I'm in it, while I'm in this corridor and I'm moving towards the end, I'm bouncing off the walls and I feel like I'm making decisions of where I'm going. But essentially every decision is, is this going to help my football career or is it going to hurt it? So it's really easy to continue to just move forward. But when your career's done, that corridor ends and you come to a big open field. And now every decision is possible. You've got unlimited time. And because we're really fortunate, really good amount of resources mm -hmm. to be able to do anything. And the possibilities opened up all at once and it was like, there's too many decisions. It's crippling. It's just paralyzing. How and do you work through that? Like, when do you get over the fear of yourself and get it together enough to yeah. take on life's next chapter? When you take on another opportunity. If somebody presents something that may seem interesting, then it's just, all right, I'll try that on. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like trying mask on. I was like, I'll try on this mask and I'll see if that fits. And if I don't like it, I don't have to do it. I don't have to do it forever. If I don't like it, I can just make the choice that, no thanks, that wasn't the right fit for me. And so it just kind of became a thing of saying, this isn't necessarily going to be the next 11 years of my life. Not everything is going to be my professional football career, but it's okay to try. It's okay to dabble. It's okay to fail and giving myself permission to just be okay at something rather than being great. How was it on your uh, relationship with your wife? I think we had to redefine roles. Hmm. We, had to, we had to redefine ourselves. We had to figure out, since I had more time, I was around more. But you're like I, a caged I, animal I, at time, right? Because you don't have that natural outlet that you had yeah. had. And now you're bouncing off the walls in the house, yeah. I imagine. Well, and also the decision making was always centered around me. You got to take care of the golden goose, mm -hmm. right? So I would come home, dinner would be ready. I would sit on the couch because I can't just be up walking around. I can't necessarily be playing with the kids because I got to save my energy. She always described it like a, a piggy bank of energy. Mm -hmm. I had a piggy bank of energy and all through the week I would lay on the couch, eat my food and I would only give energy out very sparingly outside of my work confines. And so everything was centered around me and my career because we both realized that this is the only chance we're going to get to make this kind of a living. And so it was all centered around me. And then it became, through retirement, not about me. And we had two boys who were kind of becoming more than just lumps who ate and pooped and slept. They became humans that needed attention. And then it was not about me anymore. It was about them. And it was about just trying to establish to them what I thought they needed dad to be. And so it became like, how, how do I work back into this family dynamic? So you come into, uh, into civilian life and uh, next thing you know, through your own design or, or foist upon you, I'm not sure which, you become uh, one of the more vocal uh, folks in the community regarding the Chargers relocation plan. Right. Was that by your choosing or because everybody knew who you were and had hoped you'd say something. You know, if you go back and you look at my retirement speech, part of that speech was directed towards the Chargers and part of it was directed towards the city of San Diego and the politicians to say, we've got to figure out a way to get this stadium done. So by my retirement speech, I was saying, I want to do anything I can to get a stadium built here for the Chargers and for the city of San Diego 
And I felt like a lot of what I have said up until now has been just really fulfilling that obligation to set out to do my best to do anything I could to keep the team here in San Diego. When they left, what was your emotion? <laughs> That's taken a while to unfold the whole process of that. So when they left, I'm on air at extra 1360 in the morning and we had heard news that it was a potential that the Chargers were going to say they were going to relocate. Well, at about seven o'clock or so that morning, they declared they were going to relocate and they did it through a letter. Dean wrote a letter that the Chargers released through their Twitter account. And Fox 5 happened to be in studio that day, and I was on air. So I had a job to do on both accounts, and I let my emotions just pour out naturally. It was just really organic, and I was disgusted that they broke up with the city of San Diego through a letter. And I said I wasn't upset with the decision to leave. I was just upset with the decision of how they chose to leave. Shocked at all? Uh, like at the end of the day, did you think no matter what, they're, they've got to come back. They're going to yeah, come back. Yeah. And that's why I was so hurt because I thought there's no way they're going to give up on this city. And I think a lot of people thought that, mm -hmm. that there's no way they're going to move up north, that there's no way they're going to take 56 years of memory. And they did. And was I shocked? I was stunned. I was hurt. I was angry. I was scared. I was scared of... One, what life's going to be like without the team in town. Mm -hmm. What is my future? What does my career look like? Where do my memories go? Who are my boys going to worship? Mm -hmm. What does life look like in a city without professional football? You're a broadcaster with them was, at this point. Yeah. Right? So they yeah. pull the plug and they head up north. You've got decisions you've got to make. Right. Yeah. And it was, uh, it was just a, a really... And it's still been just trying to figure out what the emotions about the whole situation are. Because my life was tied to the Chargers at that. I was a captain of the team for five years. I became a field reporter for them. And then I was a color commentator. Mm -hmm. And then two months after that or a month after that, they decide they're leaving town. And I thought, what the heck is going on here? And I was scared and I was hurt and I was angry. And how I've always dealt with those emotions, hurt is to lash out, be aggressive and to say things that potentially I may regret. What does the future look like to you? Spending a lot of time with the family, getting to do really cool experiences. And for me, the most important thing is finding opportunities that are challenging enough for personal growth, that make me uncomfortable, that put me in positions that I don't necessarily like, that there's resistance because I know on the other side of that resistance, there's something really healthy. And so whatever that is, whether it's public speaking or whether I don't know what the possibilities are, but the one thing I know I want to transmit is the benefits of living a healthy and active lifestyle. Part of that, uh, the Mount Kilimanjaro journey? Yeah, that you recently I would went. love to do more of that. Yeah. I'd love to climb more mountains. I find so much peace and just putting one foot in front of another. What was the trigger behind even doing that? In the first well, a phone call from Chris Long. Really? Chris Long, yeah, he was a defensive end for the Patriots. He's got a foundation, and that was, he said, do you want to climb Kilimanjaro? And I asked Jamie, and she said, I said, well, it's 12 days away from home. And she goes, Nick, it's once in a lifetime. You can't pass it up. So whatever it takes. And now I'm just looking for the next mountain. What's your, uh, what's your greatest takeaway from that Kilimanjaro trip? You don't have to do anything. You get to do everything. So you don't have to go to work. You get to go to work. And being the takeaway came from being with veteran amputees and one completely blind Green Beret. So we had a ranger who got his leg shot off in a training mission. I had a female above the knee amputee with us, a Temecula girl, Kirsty Innes is her name. She became the first above the knee amputee to summit, female to summit Mount Kilimanjaro. She was with our group. And then a completely blind former Green Beret. And I thought, these people are out here pushing themselves and doing it for no other reason to just do it. And I thought, you don't have to do any of this. You get to do all of this. I've seen pictures of you without 
I think there's one right behind you. We have just a little one, a couple yeah. up here. You went in full, I and mean, your wife says you could do everything 100%. You yeah. went all the way. So what was the, the idea behind uh, right, maybe I'll get one, and now you're sleeved up. Yeah, things uh, certainly spiraled there. There was... <laughs> <laughs> My hero, when I was looking from the outside at the football world, was Kyle Turley. Mm -hmm. And Kyle Turley was a super aggressive, long blonde hair, surfer guy, played for the Saints. And I remember watching a Monday night football game in, New Orleans, in uh, college and Kyle ripped the guy's helmet off and he slung it down the field because he was protecting his quarterback. And I thought, that's who I wanna be. I wanna be that guy. And he was all tatted up and he was super aggressive. And I thought, I wanna look like that. I wanna play like that. I wanna be that guy. Hmm. And so I became that guy. And is there particular significance like when most people get tattoos that they no. like a thing or has meaning or it... no for me it's aesthetics mm -hmm. it's just simply aesthetic and part of it was I'm a suburban white kid mm -hmm. from Indiana and the mean streets of Indiana the, yeah sure. the mean streets <laughs> but the thing is when you're playing football and you're looking across the field at a guy that you've never met you don't really know his bio you don't know where he's from First impressions are everything. Mm -hmm. I liken it to somebody walking into prison and you see the movies where when you're going into prison, it's like, can you make me ugly, mm. please, so nobody wants to take advantage of me. That's the same way I felt about going into an NFL locker room. I was just a scared white boy from suburban Indianapolis going into a scary locker room with terrifying athletes. and. I wanted to give out a first impression that this dude's maybe a little crazy. You don't want to mess with him. So I think behind all of it, it was more uh, first impressions really last than they do. And in football, when you look at a guy, you can't, you don't know him. You can't see past whatever he's presenting. And for me, that was what I wanted to present, and it worked. Do you still feel a little scary, a little intimidating, even though you're 80 pounds lighter? No, I feel <laughs> artsy now. <laughs> I, feel I feel artsy. I feel like a hipster now. Like, That's fantastic. Is there any one in particular that uh, you want to describe or mean something to yeah, you? Yeah, so this one actually does have a little bit of meaning. I'll stand up. Hold on oh. just a second, Mike. Can I stand up? Yeah, Hi, buddy boy. So this is a, a huge side piece, and that's an orangutan. Staring at a skull. Yeah. Contemplating Give life. Give me the story. Contemplating life and death. Okay. So this, I, I told Jamie the orangutan was her. <laughs> Every woman wants to hear that. Yeah, sure. it's her. Sure. Honey, this orangutan. So the skull, is, the skull is essentially contemplating life and death and knowing that at some point we're all mortal, we're all going to die. Down here, there's a big hourglass, okay. which is signifies just make the most of your time here. Make the most of your days. Get out of this life what you intended to get out of it. Are and you done with the tattoos now? Or no, I'll get no? more. Yeah. I'll is there anything more. on you, any, any place on your body that we can talk about on television that it's you sacred. won't tattoo? I don't want to go back and do my ribs again because that hurt no. like hell. Face, neck? Oh, neck, no. No. No, because deep down, I'm, I'm like a... If I didn't have these tattoos, I'd be a fairly conservative guy. Yeah. I would just be your standard polo wearing white boy. <laughs> but now it's like, well, I'm, I'm a little artsy and I'm a little funky. Little but edge. No, I don't want to go neck tattoo, face tattoo. That's, I, I don't think my dad would be too proud. That's where you got to draw the line somewhere and every man has his limits. Yeah. Yeah, that's it.